Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my talk tonight is on logistics and costs for Australia to achieve net zero carbon dioxide emissions by 2050. Uh, firstly, thanks to Gina Reinhardt for her good wishes for my talk tonight. Now, I hope to demonstrate to you tonight that it would actually be impossible to achieve the logistics required to achieve net zero in Australia and that the cost would be horrendous. I've uh, carried out a lot of analysis and I've produced a 17-page report on this subject tonight. It's just uh, drawn from that report. It, it's obviously uh, not going to be as detailed as that. I'm very worried about how Western nations are rushing like lemons to the edge of the cliff to embrace this net zero stuff. It's quite amazing. But it's not surprising when you consider the pressure that all these uh, governments are under. The pressure's coming from global elites like Prince Charles, uh, from uh, left-wing media, green groups, and uh, climate alarmists. Speaking of climate alarmists, this is one of the leading alarmists. He knows that climate is real. He can see it with his own eyes. And he knows it in his bones. I suspect that the feeling in his bones is just simply arthritis. <laughs> now, here is another leading climate alarmist. And some of the things that this girl, Greta Thunberg, says are just quite ridiculous. For instance, entire ecosystems are collapsing. And we are at the beginning of a mass extinction. There may be a mass extinction of brain cells in some quarters, but that's about it. But I consider Greta Thunberg to be very dangerous. She's dangerous because so many young people relate to her and believe the apocalyptic statements that she's making. And you see uh, uh, children marching in the streets, some with tears streaming down their faces because they really believe what she's saying. And they are traumatised. A lot of them really believe that the world is coming to an end in their lifetimes. So let's get down to some facts instead. Now, my uh, report and tonight's talk is based on the Australian government's own energy figures. It's a report called the Australian Energy Update, Commonwealth of Australia 2020, Guide to Australian Energy Statistics 2020, and other sources shown in the end, end notes to my report. Quick few definitions. A watt is a unit of energy. A kilowatt is a thousand watts, a megawatt is a thousand kilowatts or a million watts, and a gigawatt is a thousand megawatts or one billion watts. Okay, we've got that out of the way, let's move on. Now, electricity generating plants are usually designated as having a cap capacity of so many megawatts or gigawatts, but that's not very helpful. What we really need to know is how much electricity that plant can produce in a set amount of time. And a megawatt hour, for instance, is the amount of electricity produced in one hour by a one, megabot, one megawatt generator. And a one megawatt, megawatt coal or nuclear plant can produce 8,760 megawatt hours in one year. And where did the 8,760 come from? The number of hours in a year. Uh, for wind and solar, the multiplier is 8,760 by 5 over 24 on the basis that they will only produce electricity in around about 5 hours in each 24. That may be a bit seem a bit harsh, but don't forget this is an average over a year. And just hark back to winter we've just had, there were many days with virtually no sun at all. And to illustrate my point, <laughs> you may not see that too well up the back because it's all white, but that is a very large solar farm in Germany in February of this year. And it's all white because the thousands of solar panels are covered in snow and ice. So they wouldn't produce much electricity for some time. And of course, the uh, windmills freeze up from time to time as well. 
Now, here's the first of a number of tables. Don't worry if you can't read the numbers. Uh, this is taken from the government's own report, and it appears in my uh, report. Um, but I'll give you the key figure in just a moment. There's only one difference between the government's report and, or their table and my table, and I've added an extra column in there called gigawatt hours, because the government, in its wisdom, uses another unit of energy called petajoules. And not many people have heard of that, uh, where they've probably, most people have heard of gigawatt hours. So I've done the conversion where one petajoule is equal to 277 gigawatt hours. And I'll be using gigawatt hours rather than petajoules from here on. But there's the figure to take away from that table. The total fossil fuel energy consumed in Australia in one year is 1.6 million gigawatt hours. Now let's have a look at the difficulty of converting some items to electric. Take this uh, Caterpillar dump truck. It's powered by a 4,000 horsepower turbocharged diesel. Now if you're going to convert that to electric by putting, say, an electric motor at each wheel, you're going to need a lot of batteries to power that, say, through an eight-hour shift. And I've done the calculation using the latest battery from the Tesla electric vehicles. And to power this with enough batteries to do that shift, you would need 64 tonnes of Tesla car batteries. <laughs> Bear in mind that Tesla batteries are quite heavy. Each one's nearly half a tonne. And uh, you're not going to run this on electric motors. Although I think a lot of us would like to be on one of these sometime soon and get out of this place for a holiday. Now here's another table. This is uh, the difficult parts uh, of the uh, industry that to convert to electric, that is transport, manufacturing, mining and agriculture. And on agriculture, uh, Gina Reinhardt sent me a note saying, I hope you tell everybody how difficult it is for the pastoral industry and the farmers. They're having such a hard time recently with uh, bushfires and droughts. And if they're forced to go uh, net zero, it's going to finish some of them, they're going to have to leave the land. Now, I've made the assumption, and it's purely an assumption, that 50% of all those uh, gigawatt hours can't be con converted to electric. You're going to have to get um, offsets for them. Um, but it doesn't matter if I'm out by a long way because it swings and roundabouts. You either have more offsets and less wind turbines or more of the other. So uh, that's the number I've picked to work with that. So going back to the original figure, the total fossil fuel consumption is 1.6 million gigawatt hours. Amount to be offset is 516, or we'll say 500,000 gigawatt hours. That's to be offset where it can't be converted. So the amount of fossil fuel to be replaced by renewables is 1 million gigawatt hours. And I'll go through how we could possibly achieve that, hopefully. So there's the task. Replace 1 million gigawatt hours of fossil fuels with wind, solar, nuclear and carbon offsets. And there is a GE Hitachi 300 megawatt small modular nuclear reactor. And the politicians are going to get, have to get their heads around nuclear if they mean business. Now, the, the advantage of these small modular nuclear reactors is that the modules are built in a factory, shipped to site and assembled on site, which makes it a lot easier. Now, the reason I chose this GE Hitachi uh, modular reactor is because they have already made a submission to the federal government. Now, did you know that the federal government had an inquiry into the prerequisites for nuclear energy in Australia in 2019? And as a result, GE Hitachi uh, made a submission. Wind turbines, each turbine on average uh, generates six gigawatt hours per annum. Some of them produce a lot more, but again, I've taken the average figure. That means that by 2050, 
uh, the Australian government will need 120,000 of these monsters. 120,000. Think about it. That's uh, uh, 4,285 4, a year, or 357 a month. Now you can see why I'm saying that the logistics are, are impossible to achieve. You're never going to put anything like that up in, in, that, in that period of time. And uh, there's one of the new green jobs that's uh, been provided, picking up uh, bird carcasses that have been minced by the uh, rotor blades. And the other 20% uh, will come from solar farms. And again, if you're going to replace 200,000 gigawatt hours, that's 20% of the requirement, with solar farms, and each farm generates around 9 gigawatt hours per annum. Again, some produce a lot more, but I've taken an average figure. So taking that average figure, you're going to need 22,000 solar farms, or 785 a year, or 65 a month. Can you see how impossible this is looking to get anywhere near the logistics required? And there's another green job that will be generated. Now we come to the carbon offset calculations. Again, don't worry if you can't see the numbers. I've just worked out how much CO2 is uh, emitted by fossil fuels and how much CO2 is absorbed by trees. And I've selected for the tree Pinus radiata. It's well adapted to Australian conditions and it's a fast growing tree. And the best information I've got is each tree, when it's mature, will absorb about 10 kilos of CO2 per annum. So that's a lot of trees, and that's the number of trees you'll need. 35 billion trees need to be planted at a total cost of $53 billion. And that's at $1.50 a tree. And that price includes the price of the seedlings, the labour to plant the tree, provision of roads, fire breaks, management, and the acquisition of land. So I think that's a pretty reasonable price to assume. So now we're getting to where all of those add up, uh, and again I'll show you on the next slide the number. That's, that's the total infrastructure cost, according to my calculations, $854 billion. And at this stage it might be... Uh, a good idea just to quickly mention hydrogen before somebody asks me. Um, and the first thing to understand about hydrogen, it is not a source of energy. It takes more energy to create or produce hydrogen than you get back out of it. Um, I regard hydrogen as really a uh, mobile battery. You can create the hydrogen, put it, pressurise it, put it into a vessel and you can ship it anywhere you like. So it has the advantage over ordinary bat batteries that are fixed in location. That's about the only advantage of hydrogen. And I had a look into Andrew Forrest's grandiose scheme uh, for producing 15 million tonnes of hydrogen per annum. And he's going to get it up, he says, to 50 million tonnes. Now, at 15 million, using the same sort of figures that I did here, I calculated that he will need... 750,000 gigawatt hours of electricity per annum. That's half of Australia's total energy needs. And just think of how many wind turbines, how many solar farms, probably some nuclear plants that he's going to need. But there's more. This is Dr Brian Fisher, Managing Director of BA Economics. He's a highly respected econo economist. He once headed up a government department and he advised the government on climate change. But he started his own economics consultancy and during the 2019 election campaign when the Labor Party proposed to cut emissions by 45% by 2030, Dr Fisher's firm uh, decided to model this to see what it really meant as far as the economy goes. Now, his modelling doesn't take into account the infrastructure. This is the modelling as it affects the economy. And this is what he, his firm found. 
The GNP loss by 2030 is 542 billion. That's the loss to the gross national product. These are his figures, and I've just included them in here because uh, he comes highly regarded. He also found that electricity will rise by 85%, real wages to fall 8%, and 167,000 jobs lost. So let's summarise what I've said so far. To achieve net zero carbon dioxide by 2050, Australia will need to decommission 1 million gigawatt hours of fossil fuel devices, install 120,000 wind turbines over 60,000 square kilometres, requiring 36 million tonnes of steel and 145 million tonnes of concrete. And uh, I've, these are real figures that I've got from various sources, and those sources are indicated in the end notes to my 17-page report. Uh, we'll need to install 6 million rooftop solar systems, build 22,000 solar farms, build 25 nuclear-powered electricity generators for baseload power, plant 35 billion trees. That's all there is to it. Simple. <laughs> And here's the total cost there, but again, I'll put it on the next slide. The cost, including infrastructure and Dr. Fisher's modelling, $1.4 trillion. Meanwhile, China is building or planning at least 43 new coal-fired power stations. They're not buying into this net zero stuff at all. And this is an interesting statement, a recent speech from Xi Jinping. Our aim is, quote, the ultimate demise of capitalism and the ultimate victory of socialism. And by doing what these Western governments are doing, they're going to assist him greatly in that regard. He's probably also said, thank you, Australia, for your help via your net zero stupidity. <laughs> and we get stronger, you get weaker. Now, this is Alan Finkel. In 2017, he was Australia's chief scientist and he appeared before a Senate Estimates Committee in that year and uh, Senator Macdonald asked the chief scientist if Australia produces 1.3% of the world's emissions and that 1.3% was removed via net zero, what impact would that have on world climate? And the chief scientist's answer was, quote, the impact would be virtually nothing. So all that pain, all that cost for no impact. A couple of quick commercials. Uh, that's my current book, Western Civilization Under Siege. I bought a couple of copies along tonight if anybody wants to buy one. Maxine's got them over there. $20 cost price. And this is my new book that'll be out in two or three months. It's called The Fifth Column, How It Is Destroying Our Society From Within. And there are many uh, groups and organisations working to, to overthrow our system, uh, destroy capitalism, and replace it with some form of socialist utopia. And I've called it The Fifth Column because the definition of a fifth column is a group of people within a country acting against the best interests interest of that country and aiding and abetting an enemy of that country. So I've lumped them all under that same heading, the fifth column. So there we have it. Now, we, uh, I, at these meetings I hear people say from time to time, what can we do about all this? Well, I'll tell you something positive you can do tonight. You can go to my website there, globalcomment.net, download that 17-page report, it's in PDF form, and send it to as many people as you can. Your friends, colleagues, newspapers, radio stations, politicians. We've got to head off this juggernaut before it destroys our economy and before it creates a very bleak feature, future for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you.
Well done, that man.